We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight is our first AMA of 2020. We're here to answer your question live. We will be taking questions from our chat room, the lobby, plus we have a few questions that we received earlier on social media that we can cover. First up, Ryan Peach asks, have you ever given up on a game, walked away from the table, either because you just stopped having fun or couldn't understand what you needed to do to play or some other reason? I know it's happened, but not often, like almost never. I we usually play through to the end just to, to get to the end. And I know we, we, pro, we profess this on the show that if you're not having a good time, you should stop. I'm always usually one to at least finish off the game the first time. Um, I swear it's happened and I just can't think of a game. Like I, I know I played something and walked away. Um, I did quick cards against humanity once. One of the times I played it where I was like, this isn't actually fun or funny. Uh, that was at a birthday party. So, but I don't know if that really counts. Uh, we, definitely, uh, never. We, we definitely did un, uh, you know, box up uh, a game of Hogwarts Battle at one point because it was just, there's there's no, you know, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we definitely, definitely never one I couldn't understand. I, I Actually, to be honest, the first time I tried to play Shapousa, um, I tried to learn the rules and sit down and play it at once, and I gave up, and I went, I'm going to have to go on the internet and try to find an FAQ. And there's another game called Nemesis which was put out by Rackham, the people who used to do the confrontation miniatures. And it was originally released in French. And as far as I can tell, they used Google Translate to produce the English rules. And I literally could not figure out how to play. And there's, I sat down with someone, I think it was probably Eugene, because it's a two-player miniature battle game, very much like a Space Hulk. And we're like, we're going to figure out how to play this. And no, we, we gave up. <laughs> so yeah, it, it has definitely happened. The more I think about it, yeah, it's happened. Um, Running out of time is most often. Like, we've given up on many games due to running out of time, especially running events at the local game store with them closing at 10 at yeah, night. they close at 10 o'clock at night. Not much you can do. Yeah, 9.30, we've had, to kill, we've had to kill games many times, but that's not really giving up on a game. Yeah, and I can't think of anything that I've, you know, given up on into the point of I've given up on this and I'm not coming back to it. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, Hogwarts Battle, you know, we gave up on that game because we were already so far in the hole, there was no, there was no pulling out. Uh, yep. But we've been back to it uh, multiple times since. Uh, I can't think of any game where I've just been, no, I'm over it. Like, there's <laughs> enough games where I, where I didn't quit, where I finished, and I'm like, I don't need to play that again. That's yeah, yeah definitely one and done, but not, but not we finished. Usually, and and not. We usually finish the game. He, uh, plus, you never know, there might be something redeeming at the end, right? Like, oh, yeah. the final scoring is actually neat, or he ends up you, you didn't know how to play properly. Yep. All right, next up, uh, another question from Ryan. Is there a game you've chosen to stick with to explore the possibilities despite any rough edges it might have, like a bad rule ba book, a long FAQ, or some other complicated or awkward thing, including maybe RPGs. I'm back, I'm back to Shafosa, because like I said, the first time I gave up on it, and it was on in my pile of shame for, I fig we figured out it was like six or eight years. It was crazy. It was the game in my pile of shame the longest, and last year in January, when we dedicated, we started the no sh Less Shame, More Game Challenge, and we were like, I'm going to play everything that's currently in my pile of shame, and I'm going to start with the oldest game. I'm like, I am going to sit down and we are going to learn Shapousa. And it wasn't bad. Like once we figured it out, uh, that rule book was terrible and it took a while to figure it out. And it took four of us at the table a couple of times. Like I remember going here, you read this, see what you think. You read it and see what you think. And you read it and see what you think. And then we kind of voted on what happened and then decided to go with that. We're like, all right, so that's one. Um, RPGs, I've definitely done it with, uh, I tried to run, uh, the one of the worst, most famous ones, World of Cinnabar. So I we took the time to make characters and tried to play World of Cinnabar, but that was more for bragging rights, so I can tell people that I've actually ran World of Cinnabar. <laughs> so that was one we stuck through. But I wouldn't say we had fun or, or anything. Uh, the Masters of the Universe, you can just read our review. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say any further. But yeah, we stuck with it. We explored the possibilities. There weren't very many. Lots of rough edges, and we gave up on it. Um, Fastest Star Trek. That one's got some some rough rules for RPGs. Um, that's that's the ones off the top of my head. There may be more. All right, uh, Zanister asks, "What's the best game you've played with the worst components and the worst game with the best components?" Uh, that's that might take me a bit to think about. <laughs> what had the worst component? I know I played games with like 
really boring, useless components, but I'm trying to think of what. I man, I am trying to I'm trying to I know it's happened. I just can't think of it. I, I know I, for me, I think it's interesting. And, I, and again, I still have to give this game a second chance. I haven't yet. But uh, Wasteland that, Express. Wasteland Express. Fantastic components. Mm-hmm. Great management system. Yeah. I, the game didn't click for me. I just yeah. didn't get it. But man, is it some nice stuff in that yeah, box. Yeah, no, that's a fair one. I, I'm going to say game with the worst components, Primordial Soup. You're, you're, I get it. You're supposed to be an amiibo, but you're playing like a, a square or an octagon or a hexagon with a pole on it. And you put little beads on top of it to show like what level you are. And then when you eat things, they shit out. Oh, we're not supposed to use that word. <laughs> poop out. They poop out cubes. So like you eat a green cube and you poop two green cubes of, or you poop two cubes of your own color. You eat a green cube if you're red and then you poop out two reds and you go around. Um, I, it looks horrible. Like it, it, it is some of the most boring geometric shapes, wooden bits on a just big blue board with a grid on it that's supposed to represent the primordial sea. And you have, like, this cool stuff, like, you can evolve your thing, but there's nothing that represents that. You just put cards in front of you. The card art is is childish at best. Like, it just, that game could use an upgrade. So there, I'm, I'm going to say, and it's a fantastic game. So I'm going for, like, like that's a top 10 game. I love that game. So that's one of the best games I've ever played, and the components in that are pretty bad. Uh, similarly, and kind of in the same vein, Dominant Species. So here you have this game about evolving your arachnids, or you could be the hominids, or you could be or no hominids. There's um, I'm trying to think of what monkeys are called. Orangutans, but the, whatever. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank on on English today, not game names. Or you could be the avians, or you can be the reptiles, or whatever the mammals. I think it might be is what the monkeys are. But again, all your animals are just represented by cubes, and your dominance and a reason is just a big wooden cone. And it shows, look, the monkeys own this area with a big cone in your color. Like, it just, like, the rest of the board's okay. It just, it looks like Catan with cones and cubes on it. That could use, like, there's companies out there that make little wooden meeple to represent all your little animals. And a, and a big one that represents dominance. And the game just looks so much cooler. It looks like you got, you know, Pangea in front of you with all this stuff on there. Yeah, at a certain point, I mean, you can go to Etsy or even board game the Board Game Geek st- store yeah, and upgrade sure. components for pretty much any mm-hmm. game out there. So yeah. to find a to find a, a a good game with really bad components is just something you haven't upgraded yet, really. <laughs> yeah, in a way, yeah, yeah, true. Now, as for best components, terrible game, there are tons of those. Like I, there's all the gamified games. Like going back to there was the the Star Wars uh, Return of the Jedi game, which had the sail barge and miniatures to represent all the the orcs and stuff. But the actual game was a rolling move where you just push things off. Like it was or, terrible. I mean, we can go we can go to the more mo- or the more recently reviewed uh, Labyrinth. I mean, yeah. fantastic yeah, miniatures. That's a great, Everyone yeah, should Labyrinth buy this game and, for the miniatures, and the game isn't a game. Yeah, Labyrinth, the board game. That was that was terrible. Or And I have to assume that the Dark Crystal one's just as bad. Um, For me, I, I'm not a big fan of Scythe, and that's, like, super overproduced game. But that's not the worst. Yeah. Like, that's definitely <laughs> not the worst. Like, it's, it's definitely people enjoy it. But, yeah, prettiest game that's terrible. Labyrinth is probably a good call. You got me beat on that one. But there are tons. Like, there's these games that come out with the, the amazing miniatures, there's miniature games like there's versions of Warhammer I've tried, like the the Warhammer side games that right. I'm like, oh, so not for me. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Jerry Milo Johnson on Facebook wrote, "When the table breaks out in nothing but social interaction, do you go with it as the DM or force them back on task?" All right, the one problem with this question is I don't know if they mean in-game social interaction or not. So is this your... I think, I think, I, I, I remember the question. I did see this question on Facebook. To me, it felt like they were talking about not in-game. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking, right? Like if you're sitting there and you're supposed to be going in the dungeon and killing orcs and you're talking about what was on TV last week and what you had for pizza and the latest episode of Insert Whatever Popular Show Here, that, that can be a problem. But it can, really... I, almost all these RPG questions are going to be based on your group. It totally depends on the vibe of your group. If you're a group that gets together all the time anyway, if you're a group of friends that hung out and you were just at the bar last night or two days ago, you're all having dinner together or at the coffee shop or whatever, then at that point, I don't know if it's necessarily the DM's job, it's someone's job, whoever the, the host is to get everyone on track. Like you can talk about this stuff later. But then if you're a group of friends and you live in four different cities, two hours apart, and you never see each other and you get together to game and you end up just talking to each other and catching up and having a good time, maybe not. 
So I, I don't have a definitive answer for this. It really depends on your group. In general, this kind of goes back to my uh, players skipping out on game night, may, not making game night. You made a commitment to game. And you should game. You should try to game. You should try to do it. Remind everyone, hey, we're here to play a game. Remember three weeks ago we had session zero and said we're going to get together every Tuesday and we're going to play? Well, we're going to play. And actually starting the game and getting to the game and stuff like this, out of game talk, is something that should be part of that social contract, verbal or not. I, I personally would push towards trying to get people back on track. Right. Now, if we're talking about in-game, again, very group dependent. It depends on the game I'm playing. If I'm playing Dungeon Dragons 4th Edition and we're about to siege a castle and everyone just sitting outside talking to the first guard they meet, I'm going to get a little frustrated. But if it's at the end of the dungeon adventure and they just got back to town and they're meeting up with their long lost brother and the innkeep that they've known since the first adventure and someone's whatever, go for it, right? Like I have had that D&D &D session where you sit down and you do the, the, the wow, we role played someone, we didn't even roll a die. And you're all, it's almost a neat thing sometimes. And there are people out there who will claim you didn't play D&D &D then. Ah, you can go play with uh, Mr. <laughs> I've been playing since 1974. Yep. Um, I, I personally think, it, again, you judge the group. I have no problem with people getting into social interaction in game in an RPG. It is an RPG. You may want to have, now this is the thing, this is the, the big boy pants moment. Put the big boy pants on, big person pants, sorry, big person pants on and be like, look, guys, do we want to keep doing the social interaction because I'm good with it? But I was really hoping we could get to this part of the adventure. It's up to you. Meta game it, right? Like ask. There's no, you don't, breaking immersion in a role playing game doesn't ruin the game. All right, uh, another one. Uh, now, Kenyon Burgess uh, uh, says, this would be a good opportunity to discuss delays in gaming plastic pieces in miniature shipments coming over from China due to the flu tariffs, or flu and tariffs, I guess. The, you know, they got, we, got a, we got a multiplicity of problems happening right yeah. now. Uh, so supposedly all the board game tariffs because of uh, the U.S. president were, are all on pause. None of that happened, or it may still happen, but there are no delays to any board game shipments for that. Um, there's no rising costs. Uh, every publisher I have listened to when I listen to enough podcasts put out by publishers have guaranteed their prices will go up. So if the U.S. does start taxing China for these imports on toys and games, uh, do the plastics, because a lot of our games count as that now. Although they'll, they'll get lumped in, so even the wooden Rio Grande games will get covered too. So I think most of those are published in Germany. But anyway, um, they were, prices are going to go up. So if it happens, they're going to go up. Flu tariffs I haven't heard about. I'm assuming this has to do with the coronavirus. Well, I, don't, I don't think it's flu tariffs. I think it's the flu or tariffs. I mean, okay, I big shipments coming from uh, China could get held up because if the population of China, the working yes. population of China is uh, well, unable is to that. go to work so, for... So one of the things is I don't think you have to worry about getting the flu from anything from China. I really, no, no. I'm, I'm pretty sure the stuff can't survive for that many days on a ship. But maybe not. I don't know if that'll have a big impact. But yes, production in China right now is terrible. Uh, their their companies are not going to be able to keep up. So there are going to be delays. It's it's going to happen. The thing, the secret here is don't get mad at the Kickstarter, the guy who got your three dollars, who launched a Kickstarter that made a thousand dollars and it's the first thousand dollars ever made in the gaming industry. Don't go yell at him because his Kickstarter is delayed. It's not under their hands. Same thing, don't go to Queen Games and do the same. And don't go to Queen Games and be really mad that you're not getting your copy of whatever Copenhagen the right and roll and right. Like, it, these are unavoidable things that are part of production and publishing. Like, now, when the person who created the Kickstarter doesn't realize that Chinese New Year means everything's delayed for two weeks, then you can be upset. Yeah. But when it's something like this, just don't well, take and it part over. Of, and part of the problem that's really hitting this industry right now is we had the Chinese New Year but that Chinese yes. New Year is essentially being extended yes. for an indeterminate period of time mm. because there's a nasty virus that is massively impacting the population. Yeah. So. So yeah, there's gonna be there's gonna be delays through that. Um, there might be price increases. Like I said, just don't take it out on the wrong people. Just accept it. It's it's a something happened. It's it's a game. You'll get it eventually. Yep. All right. Well, Michael Hutchinson writes. How do you deal with the gamer that has a few too many drinks, but you really like that person? I, you know what? I really like that person. It's not an excuse for any bad behavior. It's not nowadays. Grow up. Um, someone has a few too many drinks. You ask them to stop playing. It's like, hey, it's time to time to go home. You've had enough. It's time to uh, it's time to buck up. But you know what? You're no longer welcome at our like. Hey, here, have your drinks. Go sit over there. Do your own thing. Go play video games. 
do whatever, stop bothering us while we're trying to play games. Um, go home, don't drive home, get them, call them a cab, drive them home, whatever it takes, send them to bed. Like I said, just don't let it interfere with the rest of the game night. If it happens to be that it doesn't interfere, call the game, call the night, be like, hey, it's time to go home. We were having a good time, but you know what? It's getting late. You can be semi-polite about it. If the person doesn't take it well, well, that's dealing with a drunk person, which is way beyond anything okay. I'm going to get into. Yep. All right. Uh, Ryan in the chat room asks, what are your favorite RPG live plays? Edited to be more like audio dramas and less like a live raw feed. All right. I don't do a lot of uh, actual plays. It's not really my jam. Uh, I don't know what it is. I I mainly I get I want to yell at the DMs or the players <laughs> like I listen to them and I'm just like no why did you do that especially like when the DMs do things like call for die rolls for things that like I know if the person fails it's just the, the story stops so why'd you even call for a die roll or, or I get frustrated with players what the hell's this spell do again and I'm like you've asked that every episode so I have a hard time listening to them but I do like ones where they cut all that stuff out, right, and produce it more like an audio drama. Uh, the one I had the most enjoyment with was Streets of Avalon, which was the Wednesday evening podcast All-Stars, people from the uh, Gem crew playing with the people from Gaming and BS, um, with Andy running it, so she, from Sass Geek. So, like, a whole a bunch of podcasts and people I dig all got together and did an actual play, right? Knights of the Night was another podcast that was involved in that. And they did this D&D actual play all set in a city with this really interesting plot with this box. And it introduced people to the world of Avalon, which, interestingly enough, when they first played, was just a thing. But then they've launched a Kickstarter since, and you can now buy a source book for Worlds of Avalon. So they actually re-released the audio drama. I thought that was really well done. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, Tracy Barnett has done some really interesting... I, I, they don't quite get the audio drama, but they're still very edited actual plays. And I've enjoyed listening to some of their actual plays. Um... Those are the main the main ones I've listened to. Mostly, most of the stuff I listen to, I guess, is indie stuff. There, there was a D and D one years ago, but to be honest, I don't even remember the name of it because it's been so long since I listened to it. They, they, they I, their first episode was the was an orc was at a fair for the first time, and they talked too much about funnel cakes. But it went on to be a really good plot. But I totally don't remember what the name of that show was. Yeah, the only the only real live play I've ever even bothered listening to was Nerd Poker, um, and it really wasn't audio drama it up they 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 sort of kept it all in there that was just a bunch of comedians in la playing yeah. uh, uh see i did used to listen to the walking eye which was the exact opposite the walking eye was here there's a mic on the table <laughs> and i found it interesting because what i listened to them for was to learn the system so i would hear their foibles i would hear them wait do you roll this no do you do that oh wait do you do this and then them getting it as it went on so i listened to them they did a whole thing with the avengers and the marvel super marvel heroic role-playing game from margaret weas productions and I really enjoyed listening to that because I had a hard time getting Marvel to click and listening to them play it. The system made a lot more sense to me. Hmm. Um, what do we have here? Sean Kilgore or Gil Gilgore asks, which game has the most replayability without an expansion? Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> there's that, every RPG, but I'm sure he's talking about board games. You don't tend to call RPG books expansions. <laughs> uh, probably... <laughs> This sounds ridiculous because it's expensive, but like Gloomhaven, how many flipping hours of play you have in that game? And then like once you finish the campaign, you can go back and do all the side quests. And even that, you could still go through with another party. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if and it's you can do the randoms. Yeah, yeah, and you can do random dungeons forever. Like till the end of time, you can and, just keep doing random dungeons. And I mean, like, even... I guess it has an end. Like yeah. there's, there's probably other game. Like like people still play chess, right? <laughs> people still play Go. Like people love that, but to me, I don't want to play those that many times. Yeah, I, I find at this point, um, we're getting into a, a strange little thing where at at a, at a certain point, something like chess or go almost become closer to sport than game. Yeah. They're games. True. No, it but is. It's, it's a it's a competition. More competition. Yeah. yeah. So so I move the I move chess and go at this point over towards uh towards sport. Mario, you can play them casually, right? But but it's it's definitely a more. Well, like to me, the the Duke would be over there too. Like, I, I'm not sick of the Duke yet. I played it forever. And, I, I like, you can keep playing it forever. And every game could be different for yep. forever because there's enough different tile possibilities. It's possible you'll never see all the combinations. But to me, I don't know. For some reason, that's in a different spot to me than this. Yeah. So maybe it fits. Maybe maybe the Duke should be my game with the most replayability. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. I mean, I play Can't Stop, uh, you know, almost a yeah. game a day recently. <laughs> uh, that one, I, I can't. Can't Stop doesn't interest me enough to have the most replayability. So, yeah, Gloomhaven, I'm trying to think of something cheaper. Um, 
Well, again, know. though, when you look at Gloomhaven, again, you look at that, even a full MSRP, play. 150 bucks or so, you look at the number of plays, you look at the price per play of that game, yeah. and it becomes really cheap, really fast, as long as you've got the people to play it. Well, like, there's, like I love Shogun and Wallenstein. I don't know if I'll ever get sick of those. And again, every game is going to play different. You're never going to get the same fall from the cube tower especially when you're not using the starting setups. Everyone's going to start in different provinces. There's people who play Risk professionally, like the, almost any game, but like the most replayability. I, I, what I'm trying to think of, you know what it is? Okay, here's where my thought went from Sean's question, is what game is going to give me the most unique experiences, which is why I thought of Gloomhaven. There's going to be so many different modules with different characters, buying different equipment and playing differently, whereas the Duke kind of feels the same. Chess is definitely... You don't get a lot of new experiences. You yeah. play chess, you play chess. So I'm thinking for a game with the most replayability with, like even Catan, right? You can play, I, I know people who love Catan and played it two, three, four hundred times, but you don't get anything new out of Catan when you play it for the third, 30th time, probably, <laughs> possibly the fifth time you don't get anything new out of Catan. Whereas like a Gloomhaven, you're going to keep getting new stuff out of that. Uh, it, plus, if there's anything, I'm trying to think of something where you make your own stories. There's probably something like that, like Rory Story Cubes, right? They're being the really basic version, but I'm thinking there's got to be a more modern, more involved one. Um, there's one people are going nuts for right now, and I'm drawing a complete blank. It's technically an RPG, but it's sold in the box. It's what uh, Phil Vecchione's group is playing right now. Yeah, Ryan in the, in the chat room mentions uh, TI4. See, TI4, again, eventually you're going to you're gonna have seen all the technology. It's still, though, like with the number of different races... You're, it's going to take you forever to see it all. Right. I could I could see that. <laughs> Terra Mystica. Uh, um, yeah. Terra Mystica, I still haven't played all the races. Yep. I'm close. I'm close. I don't know how, what is there, 13 different ones? I played more than 13 times, so. <laughs> 12 races? 12? It's either 12 or 16. All right. Uh, what do we have here? Brian, our uh, longtime fan, Brian, comes up with... Uh, a longer question here, but I'm going to distill this down a little bit. Yeah. Talking about thematic grouping of games. Okay. We all played Clue when we were younger. What are some mystery-themed games that are actually good? Ah, uh, there's a few out there. There's not a lot. Like, there's all the exit games, right? There's the escape room games. I don't know if you consider those mystery-themed games. They're puzzles. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. I'm thinking of it as a puzzle. Egg, egg, so exit rooms are, are very puzzle-like to me, more, yeah. than, like, more than board game, especially with yeah, the, the one, one-time use. It's a... yeah. There's those, um, there's Mysterium, which is a co one versus many, where one player is a ghost giving clues to the other players trying to solve a murder. Um, there's all the modern detective games. There are a ton of these. Um, like Sean was talking when we were talking Nitwick last week about the things on the map. There's a bunch, there's Detective Murder in Hong Kong. There's a whole series of these detective games. There's also the Sherlock Holmes games, and there's a bunch of different series of the Sherlock Holmes games, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, and some other ones. Um, there's a big one that was hot at Gen Con. It's not a type of game that I've really had much experience with personally. And I don't know why. Like, I, it just doesn't, I don't know, solving a mystery doesn't sound all that exciting to me. Yeah, uh, I've, then of I've course, never even been the, a Sherlock Holmes reader myself. It's just yeah. not been... Uh... Then, of course, there's the the LARP ones. I, at least I'll call, I call them LARPs, basically, but all the how to host a, a murder. Those right. are definitely mysteries where you get a group of people together for a, a dinner or whatever, and you play through a set scenario and try to figure out who did it. There's definitely modern versions of Clue, really. Yeah. How many different, you know, v VCR games were there that were that? Yeah, that were there basically were basically that, that game. It yep. was a whole genre of games that tanked horribly yeah. because, well, the technology went away. But there were so many VCR games, and, and they were almost all mystery. Yeah. Yeah, there were quite a few of those. And not because like, there was Nightmare and Atmosphere are the two of them more popular. I don't even know if those were mysteries. I never played any of those. I hear I hear the Star Trek one was pretty good, but I don't think it's actually a uh I don't think it's actually a mystery. How to host a murder, I remember those. There were a bunch of those. Yeah. I'm drawing a blank and I, I what during these AMAs I try not to actually pull up Google or, <laughs> or crap board game geek. But like I said, mysteries are definitely not my normal jam. So they're out there. There are quite a few. Uh, I think it's probably a category on Board Game Geek, or at least a tag where you can sort by tag. And I'm sure if you Google Best Mystery Games, a bunch will come up. There's definitely better stuff than Clue. 
Right. Heck, I had more fun with what was that game that we did the prototype of that looked like a clue board. Oh yeah. Um, oh, oh man. Yeah, the name's escaping me. Cypress Legacy. There you go. Uh, that, that's uh, there was no mystery to actually solve there. But I mean, yeah, Betrayal House on the Hill is probably the best rated. That's a mystery. I I don't think that one's a mystery. That's that's a one versus many. You play through half the game, and then all of a sudden something horrible happens, and you have to try to do it. I don't see that as a mystery game. That one I've played. Okay. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, as uh, Mysterium is uh, yeah, best Mysterium. for kids. Uh, we're sort of looking at some other options here. Uh, Deluxe Baker Street game is, I guess, a multi-adventure. Yeah, so that's one high. of the Sherlock Holmes games. Uh, Scotland Yard would uh, come up for deduction. Uh, see, that's not that's one versus many again, right? One player's trying to escape, and the other players are trying to catch him. To me, there's no mystery to be solved. That's just right. try to outwit. Like I said, it's it's hard, right? The dot, well, depends. What and they call letters letters from Whitechapel best one versus many. Yeah, that's the one that almost all of them are based on. Uh, there's there's nuns on a run. If you want to, oh, kids apparently there's them. something. Uh, the, the Dead Bolt Mystery Society is a monthly mystery. So huh. it's a it's a subscription mystery game series. All right. Dead Bolt Mystery Society. Interesting. That one I don't know. Yeah. No. Yeah, sorry Brian, I don't have a lot of strong recommendations. If I we might do some of these as full topics. If I do them as full topics, I'll do the research and I'm pretty sure we can pull you up like the top 10 mystery games according to the internet. <laughs> of course you could probably google that yourself. They they kept they gave us the best uh, budget one is uh, mystery board game the secret door by family pastimes okay then which is uh yeah I mean twenty bucks mystery house is one I'm trying to get a review copy of okay. that's a game where the box is the board okay. and you open it up and you put the rooms inside the house and then you close it up and then you have to do stuff like look through the windows to try to solve something sounds really unique that's why I wanted to review it. Uh, they just won the 2020 Toy of the Year. I think it's Doctor Toy. It's one of the Toy of the Year rewards, not Spiel the whatever, but right. like something something North American. And they put an announcement saying, "Hey, we won!" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm gonna. This is a press release, and I can reply to this." <laughs> and I actually asked them, "I'm like, here, I really want to show this off because it sounds really unique, and I like unique games. I like right. games that do something new." And like I said, part of the game is looking through the windows and see if you can see different things. It sounds really neat. I think it's just called Mystery House. And I'm trying not to Google. <laughs> um Michael Hutchinson asks, have you been to a gaming convention and what were your pros versus cons of going to gaming conventions? I think we're definitely on the pro side overall, but overall, that's not to say there aren't cons to going yeah. to a con. Yeah, definitely. No, definitely pro been to not many. I definitely don't attend a lot of gaming conventions. But uh I try to go to two to three a year. We'll see see if that happens this year. Best thing about going to a con is you're with your people. I love the vibe of a con. I like the feeling that everyone around me has something in common with me and everyone's on the same page. And everyone, most people, I should say, you have people, outliers. But in general, everyone's there to game and to have a good time. And they know you're there to game and have time. And no matter where you are, whether it's in the washroom, so talking to people in the washroom could be weird, or at the gaming table, you, you could be talking, right? Like, oh, what'd you play that was so good today? Oh, what are you playing tomorrow? What are you doing? What's your favorite game you've seen? Like, there's just that, that common ground over the entire con that I really dig. I, I love that vibe. That's one of my favorite parts. Uh, the next thing is to be able to see stuff and tr touch it and try it without spending money first it it's the place where i get to see and try new games that includes rpgs as well like i would never have i i, I don't own fake games because i don't get it but now i played some and i had never bought a powered by the apocalypse game but i got to try one and then went and bought one or i was really curious about tales from the loop but didn't want to buy a 90 dollar book without playing it same thing for board games board games obviously right like all the games that come out at origins and everything else yeah, no, for me, it's especially, it's, uh, you know, aside from the people, and people really is a big deal, uh, but it's getting game, getting a chance to play that game that you will never play at home, you know? I don't know anyone who's going to run the worldwide wrestling game, you know? Yeah. And so my chance to get that is by going to cons. Uh, yeah. And I think for a lot of people, it's probably that's the place where you're going to get a chance to play a lot of different games yeah. you've never played, whether it's at the board game uh, library or in uh -huh. an RPG game, you know, the, you've just got so much content available to you yes. that you're not going to be able to have in your library behind you. No, very true. And I know a lot of people that go to cons because they don't have local gamers. Windsor has a fantastic gaming community. 
had maybe I had something to do with that. Maybe I didn't. Maybe it would have grown on its own. But we have a great group. I have a Facebook group where we publish events that has over 600 members. Windsor's no Toronto. We're not a big city. 600 people, not at your beck and call, but to be able to go, hey, who wants to play this tonight, right? That's fantastic. Yeah. Not everyone has that, right? I know a lot of people that go to Origins just to spend, in my opinion, way too much money for that boardroom thing to meet up with their fellow gamers that they meet up with every year at Origins and just that group of four just sit and play games together all weekend. Right. Which is awesome. If that that's your jam, do it. That's that's fantastic. So there's a definitely a big pro to access to games and gamers. Access to games and gamers probably sums up both of what we just said all a, a little bit more succinctly. Yeah. Now cons. Um the biggest one that I really flip and hate, I get sick all the time. I have a compromised immune system due to uh physical problems I have, medical problems I have. I I don't think I can go to a con and come home not sick. It just it, and it lasts and lingers. Con cred sucks. Like, I try. I wash my hands. I try. I got to stop shaking hands. The problem is I, I can't. I was just raised that's what you do, and I have a firm handshake because that's what you're supposed to do. Like, I just – I was raised with that, right? That was a big thing my dad instilled in me that I, I can't help it, right? Like, and there are certain people now that I got to know that hugging has now become more of a thing, right? Like, I, I know a lot of huggers, it seems, and it's hard not to, right? Plus – even if you're the most careful, especially playing board games, a big part of board games is touching the same pieces. Like, you can't help it. You're passing cards, you're moving meeple, yeah. you're touching stuff, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the con crud is, is probably my biggest hatred of going to cons is that week after cons. Like, I almost need a week off after every con, which thankfully now I work from home, so I can at least, you know, still work. Well, and one of the big issues and one of the big problems with con crud is, especially if you are out of town seeing a lot of people you haven't seen before you're going to be going out you're going to be staying up late you're going to be playing late because you don't want to stop playing with these people yeah. you don't want to stop playing with your friends so you're not getting those six nights six or more hours yeah. of sleep a night mm -hmm. um who knows what you're eating maybe you're eating better but maybe you're eating too much maybe you're not eating enough because you're playing games too much maybe you're drinking a little bit too much uh there's a whole lot of ways to be really unhealthy at a con um yeah. and it, it's just not hard um, I guess your next, and I, I, I totally agree, you know, it's, you have to fight to avoid the contrad, and depending on your immune system, you yeah. may have more or less luck. I guess the next con would be if you are a person that has social anxiety. Yeah. Uh, there, and there's a lot of us out there. I suffer from it. Uh, I, I struggle at the con, uh, at cons as much as I, as much as I like them, the, the density of people at some cons can really be overwhelming. Um, and and the best solution are well, there's two really. I mean, great cons like Breakout now have quiet rooms where yeah. when you do start to feel overwhelmed, you can just go and take a time out and there's a place for you dedicated for you to, to get that recharge. But the next thing is if you can, whenever possible, have a friend there. Because a lot of times having that person that you are already totally comfortable with mm -hmm. can act as an anchor. Uh, and really sort of ground you so that when things are getting a little overwhelming, you can, you know, grab their arm or, you know, squeeze their back mm -hmm. or something, turn, face them, stare in their eyes and block out the people around you and get a little bit more comfortable. Uh, and as well, mm -hmm. if you can set up a base camp, you know, it, it may not be as large as the one that Jem uh, has established and we, uh, we take part in. But even if you've got just a little corner of an area where you can go and, and hide and, and compress yeah. yourself this is a, that's a pro tip you don't hear often if you have a large enough group of people you're going to meet up with at the con like like five more than five pick a spot and have that be the spot everyone returns to so you're going to go walk the dealer hall for a bit when you're done go to that spot you're going to go play shadow run for four hours when you're done go to that spot and that just becomes like the general meetup spot and like you just pick a spot in the con right somewhere where there happen to be chairs would be nice but you just pick a spot and that's a good spot where everyone can just meet up that's a good spot where you can meet to be like hey i'm going to go grab some food do you want to grab some food stuff like that yep uh, the, okay, another con to me for cons is uh fear of missing out this covers a huge range of things one of them i like i run tabletop gaming deals i'm a cheap bastard when it comes to buying board games i will admit it I, I, I now tell other people how to save money buying board games. Buying games at cons is usually not worth it. In my opinion, you don't need to bring the game home and play it that week. E even as a content creator, we say it all the time on the show, we are not all about the new hotness. I don't think anyone needs to be about the new hotness. You, are, you don't have to have it then. 
You're not going to miss out. It doesn't even matter if the mine sold out in three hours. It'll be in game stores in three months. Wingspan, there's still people out there who haven't got it. Another printing will come. It'll come out. You'll be able to get your copy. I don't see it. Now, the only time I can see doing it, again, is if you're a content creator and you're trying to be on the cutting edge, sure, that's a, that's a thing. Plus, if you're meeting up with people to play it there at the con, I can kind of see it, right? Like, there's a hype train. There's a, there's a being part of the event, so I can kind of see it. But make sure you have the disposable income to do that. Like, you have to have the funds. Like, personally, I don't have the disposable income to be able to be part of the group that at the bar or after Origins can talk about how we all sat down and played that hot new game and be part of that hype train or we played the latest adventure or whatever it happens to be. But this also goes to events. There is no way at any con I've been to you can do everything. Like even Breakout. Breakout's not a big con. You still can't see and do everything. You're not going to get to DM with a play an RPG with every player you want to play. You're not going to get to play every game you want to play in the library. You're not going to get to take part in that LARP and go do the the overnight, uh, what is that, the world is mine space thing that's yeah. going on. Like, <laughs> like, you just can't. And that's a small con, right? Like, even at the old Windsor Game Fest, you couldn't play in the Magic Tournament and be in my Warhammer Tournament at the same time. You're going to miss out on stuff. Yep. And don't overschedule yourself because you are going to miss it, except the fact you're not going to be able to do everything and leave free time, which kind of goes back to Sean's self-care. Yeah. Uh, and it's about another thing, you know, panels. You know, there may be some great panels yeah. out there, but... Pay attention because a lot of times now on these shows, while it is important to go see panels, because if nobody goes sees a panel, panels are really <laughs> boring. But as long as some people are there, they are now almost always recording panels for yes, a later release as a podcast. So as long as not everyone <sighs> is ignoring the panel, you'll that still be rough. able to get a lot of that content later. Uh, and it's rough. very rare that you know it. Everyone will ignore it because generally the the friends and family and friends yeah. and you know fans of whoever is talking on the panel will be there no matter what so you know i if, don't know my, if you my have counter... to choose between self time or that game that you may never get to play again or a yeah. panel the panel is probably going to lose out unless you know it's vital to your specific friend you know if you're a game designer yeah. you might want to spend a little more time at panels i don't know it's it's hard not to support your friends though if it, if it's Absolutely. your friends you know they're not going to get a lot of people Go to support them just to be a seat in a chair and show that your support yeah. is part of it. But if you know it's like the dice tower, like they're, they're going to fill the room. They're like, yeah. they're not going to miss you, right? Yep. So it's kind of a think of it from two ways. Are they going to miss you? Like, are you going to be like a, a, a pillar for them to stand on when you're there? Or are you just going to be another face in the room? If you're just going to be another face in the room, you, you know it's being recorded. There's no reason not to just catch it later. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and the other, I guess the last con I get would be, depending on where what con you're talking about and where you're going, is cost. Well, yeah. Because unfortunately... That's, that's possibly the biggest. <laughs> un con. Unfortunately, uh, unless it's a local con and you know everyone involved, you're going to be traveling somewhere. You're going to yeah. be spending hotel rooms. You're going to be spending entrance for the con. You're going to be spending for every game or panel or whatever at most cons you go to. Uh, breakout's different. Breakout's generally, you know, once you get in, you're you're in. But most cons, you're paying for everything you get you do on top of paying to get into the con and stay at the con and get to the con. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's very expensive. And you need to weigh in your own life and budget whether or not that expense is worth what you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, very true. Cost because cost is the one that's hitting me the most now. That that the biggest con to cons that cost money to go to. Yeah. For me, that that is definitely the case. At least I'm not getting sick. There you go. But that being said, if you can get there and if you can afford it, they're a fantastic I, way I guess, to yeah. enjoy the game, all the games and all the fun and all the people that make this hobby great. Yeah, I would say overall the pros outweigh the cons for cons. Like I I. Everything negative we said, I still think it's worth it. I'd still go. If I could afford it, I would go to a con every weekend. Like, if it, like there's family and stuff, right? I obviously can't. I have kids, whatever. But I'm just saying, like, I would go to way more. I, I would definitely hit up more cons. I would do a Dice Tower cruise because that just sounds awesome. But, like, there's a lot of reasons I can't. But, I like, I'd love going to cons. Like, I, I would just love it if my life was a con circuit. I'm sure I'd get sick of it quick because there are people that that is their life. Yep. Is is hitting the con circuit? I met a bunch of them at the Windsor Comic Con, and man, Gil Gerard's looking rough. Yep. <laughs> All right, uh, Zamister asks, "What would you guys do?" I have a copy of Nemesis that is selling on Amazon currently for two hundred and ninety nine dollars. Would you play it or sell it? Play it. I'm not Neil. 
No, I assume I bought it to play, right? Like, it depends. If someone gave me a copy of Nemesis and I was like, yeah, I don't know, Nemesis, I'd sell it. But, like, assuming I went back to Nemesis Kickstarter, this is the alien board game, quote unquote. If I went and spent the money to get Nemesis and had a copy and I bought it to play, I would play it. It's just like I buy comic books to read them. I don't buy them because of their resale value. I have friends. I have a friend, Neil, who will do that. He'll he'll pre-order a game. He'll buy a game, not just to sell it, but it'll come out and he'll get it. And all of a sudden, it'll be short supply. He'll flip it easily. He'll be like, fine, I can buy three copies later, right? So he's very much in that. I can get it later. Well, now, to be honest, in the first place, like I'm going to wait till Nemesis is like, 50% off on Amazon before I even consider it if it actually if they ever print enough or I'm just not going to care because we're now at the stage where there are way too many games that come out and even if Nemesis is amazing I doubt it's the best game ever out there I'll play something else so no I would I wouldn't flip it if I bought it to play I would play it no matter what the price like maybe if it went for like a, I don't know, a thousand like I don't <laughs> there's probably a limit where I'd be like okay wait a minute everyone has their price this. right yeah exactly I'm sure it would get to a point but 299 wouldn't I, I, from what I remember, the game probably wasn't under a hundred bucks to get in the first place. All right, that's probably enough for the Q and A. Not shooting. I did see a couple other things in the chat, but we got some other stuff we want to get to today. So we had we had an all gaming topics. We didn't have any Minotaur milk this week, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. Thank you, everyone, in the chat room for asking your questions. For those of you who uh, sent in questions on Facebook, I hope you listen to this and get to hear your answers. I may go back uh, now that we've talked about it and post my answers on Facebook. I may not, though, just to punish you for not coming to listen. <laughs> All right. If you've got a question for us, you know where to go, right? Head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 